This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. All right, this is the second lecture, uh, working through chapter 22 of the free lecture notes, uh, where we're looking at the consolidated statement of financial position. Uh, and I showed you in the previous lecture uh, how we prepared the statement that we're adding together all the assets, all the liabilities, and also, though, what the parent company was paying for when they bought the other company. Uh, they were paying for the net assets of the other company, the share capital, plus the reserves at the date they bought it. However, they could end up, for two different reasons, paying more. And let me explain with example three. P acquired 100% of the share capital of S on the 1st of January 2005 for 60,000. And if you look at P's statement of financial position, there it is. In P's own statement, one of their assets is the shares they bought at the cost of 60,000. So let me start doing some workings. Uh, the cost of the shares sixty thousand. And what were they paying for? It, um, they bought a hundred percent of the shares, and the share capital of S was ten thousand. And as I went through before, they were also paying effectively for the retained earnings at the date they bought the shares, the pre-acquisition retained earnings. And what were they? Uh, look at the second sentence at the start, uh, top of the question. They bought the shares on the 1st of January 2005, and on the 1st of January 2005, the retained earnings of S were 15,000. So at the date they bought the shares, S's balance sheet on that date would have had share capital and retained earnings in total of 25,000. And so the net assets of S would have been 25,000. So why have we paid 60? Well, as I said, there are two reasons. One reason uh, could be that even though on S's statement the net assets would have been 25,000, we could have decided the assets were actually worth more than 25,000. You know, maybe one of their, their S's net assets was a building, which they'd been showing as normal at cost. But if that building is worth more, then obviously we have to pay more. And if you look at the second uh, part of the uh, second sentence, retained earnings of 15, the fair value of the non-current assets was 9,000 more than the carrying value. So I don't know, uh, maybe uh, they have the, a building and the building had cost them 5,000 or something. Uh, but we buy it, uh, the company, and we decide that building's actually worth 14,000. It's worth 9,000 more, and so we're going to have to pay 9,000 more. Uh, and so, all right, we're buying the net assets, which the carrying value in total would be 25, but we add. Uh, this fair, what we call it a fair value adjustment. And so, for whatever reason, at the day we bought it, we decided the assets were worth 9,000 more than S was showing them at. And so, we pay 9,000 more. It means we were prepared to pay, we valued the business at the moment at. 24, no, sorry, 25, 34,000. Well, that's fine, but why on earth did we pay 60,000? 
Well, it's something I referred to in a much, much earlier uh, chapter, that um, maybe the value of the assets in your company is 34,000, but you're already a successful company, you're making profits. Understandably, we might be prepared to pay more for the goodwill. And so if we pay more than the assets are worth, we paid 60, assets are worth 34, the extra is called the goodwill arising on consolidation. It's irrelevant in the individual statements of the two companies. P and S are as they stand in the question. They're prepared exactly as normal, but when we come to show it as one big group, as one big company, then again, uh, because S had, uh, sorry, P had paid 60,000 for something that only had assets of 34, the extra, the extra 26,000, the difference <coughs> is uh, goodwill which only appears when we come to do this consolidating. Now let's go through and prepare the statement, the consolidated statement of financial position. Basically we add up, be careful, first of all the non-current assets, Uh, P, 82,000, S, 27,000. However, appreciating S's statement, they'll have shown that you're a non-current assets at the carrying value. And yet, we decided when we bought uh, the shares um, that the uh, non-current assets were worth 9,000 more. And so from the point of view of the consolidated statement, we say the assets in S are actually worth 9,000 more than the 27,000 they're showing. So we add this fair value adjustment of 9,000. And so for the purposes of consolidation, the total non-current assets are 100 and, oh, can I do this in my head? 109, yes, 118,000. So add them together as normal, but if there is this fair value adjustment, which it's not always there by any means, but if there is, then we increase the total value of the non-current assets. Uh, the investment in S disappears as uh, always, we're replacing it with all the um, assets and liabilities of S. However, when we come to consolidate, a new asset has appeared this goodwill. We paid the extra 26,000. It's an asset which didn't appear in the um, statements of either company, but when we come to consolidate, we do show this goodwill. Goodwill arising on consolidation. I've forgotten how much it was already, 26,000. Uh, current assets add up in the normal way. 20 in P, 12 in S, so a total of 32,000. And so the total assets, 118, 176,000. Uh, what about the equity and liabilities? Share capital? As before, it's only ever the share capital of the parent company. The shareholders in P own P and effectively own S as well. And so the share capital, 50,000. The retained earnings? 
Well, as in the um, previous lecture, for the same reasons, the retained earnings is everything in P, 110,000. But as far as S is concerned, it's the earnings that S has made since the date of acquisition, the post-acquisition retained earnings. At the moment, um, 2009 when I'm doing the statement, it's 28,000. But at the date we bought the shares, back to the second sentence at the top of the question, uh, in January 2005 the retained earnings were already 15,000. And so only the difference of 13,000 has been earned since uh, we bought the shares. So the total consolidated retained earnings, 123,000. Uh, finally, the current liabilities add up as usual. Uh, two in P, one in S, so a total of 3,000. Does it add up? 50, 176,000. Perfect. So a bit extra there. Uh, and be clear, uh, two things. Firstly, this fair value adjustment. Two effects. It's one reason why we paid more than the share capital and retained earnings. On their statement, on S's statement at the date we bought the shares, their net assets will have been 25. We say they were worth 9,000 more. So we increase the value of what we bought and we increase the consolidated non-current assets by the same amount. Uh, the second new thing is this goodwill. That always we compare what we paid for the shares what we thought S was worth in total, 60,000, with what the value of their normal assets, we reckon is 34,000. The extra is this goodwill arising on consolidation, which appears as an extra asset in the consolidated statement. Okay, just one more example in this uh, chapter. Uh, nothing new, but just to check you've got it. Look at example four with me. So exactly the same problem, it's just different figures. Uh, P acquired 100% of the share capital of S on the 1st of July 2004 for 25,000. Uh, and again, look at P's statement of financial position. Always the investment, the shares they bought, will appear at the amount we paid, which was 25,000. Uh, back to the top. Uh, on the 1st of July 2004, which is when we bought them, the retained earnings of S was 6,000, and the fair value of the non current assets was 6,000 more than their carrying value, than the amount they would have appeared in S's statement. So, always before we go any further, let's check, is there any goodwill? How much were we valuing the purchase at? The cost of the investment? Twenty-five thousand? Compare with what we were buying. Well, at the date we purchased share capital in S. And we always assume it hasn't changed in paper F3. Uh, and so in 2010, the share capital was 5,000. We assume it's always been 5,000. Uh, but in addition, the pre acquisition retained earnings. So 
second sentence, on the 1st of July 2004, the retained earnings less was 6,000. And so on S's statement at the date we bought the shares, the share capital plus reserves were 11,000, the net assets would have been 11,000. But that would have been the carrying value, the value in the statement. But there's a fair value adjustment. Uh, we think they were worth, at the time, 6,000 more. And so the total value we placed on their assets, uh, 6, 12, 17,000. Why did we pay 25? The extra must be for goodwill. The goodwill arising on consolidation. Twenty five less seventeen eight thousand. Okay, now we can get straight on with the consolidated uh, statement of financial position. Uh, and remember from the previous example, uh, two things to watch for. Uh, first of all, non-current assets. Uh, we add up in the normal way. But if there's a fair value adjustment as there is here, on S's statement, they'll still be showing the carrying value of 18,000. Uh, we decided uh, that the assets were actually worth more. We add on that fair value adjustment of 6,000 that was in the second sentence. So the total value for the consolidated statement, 76, 86, 100,000. The other thing, remember, is this new asset has appeared, the goodwill arising on consolidation. I just worked it out, what was it? 8,000. Current assets, simply add up. Uh, 12 plus 9 is 21,000. So the total assets, 129. Uh, equity and liabilities, the share capital, Remember, always is just the share capital of the parent company, P, 40,000. It's P shareholders own P, P owns S, so P shareholders effectively own everything. Uh, the retained earnings should be starting to get automatic by now. But it's all of the <clears throat> all of the retained earnings in the parent company, seventy thousand. But as far as the subsidiary is concerned, it's the earnings since the date of acquisition or the post acquisition retained earnings. So as at two thousand and ten, which is when we're doing the statement, they were twenty thousand. However, at the date of acquisition. Back to the second sentence at the top, uh, they were already 6,000, so the pre acquisition was 6,000. Post acquisition, the remaining 14. Uh, finally, the current liabilities. Add up 3 plus 2 is 5, and so the total. 129, it works. So there we are. So, where are we? We know how to calculate goodwill and deal with this fair value adjustment. And we know how to calculate the retained earnings. Always all of the parent plus the post acquisition earnings of the subsidiary. All right, well, although 
that's the end of this chapter. The reason we're going to carry on in the next chapter is there's one other very big problem. In every example we've done, in all four of those examples, P owed 100% of S, the subsidiary. However, I mentioned briefly at the very beginning, we need to do this if one company controls another. And although uh, there, there's a strict definition of that, which I, I'm coming to in a later chapter, in most cases, we say they control the other if they own more than 50% of the shares. Because if they own more than 50% of the ordinary shares in the other company, they can make decisions. If we own more than 50% of S, we can tell S what to do. We effectively run S. Now again, in all four of these examples, P owned 100%. In the next chapter, we're going to look at what happens when P doesn't own 100%, maybe they own 60%, 70%, where they own more than half the shares, they have control, but they don't own the entire 100%. So make sure you're happy with what we've done in that chapter. Go back through it if you need. Try those examples again on your own. If you are happy, then carry on with the next chapter. And as I say, we'll look at the situation where P doesn't own a full 100%.